Welcome to Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artist Series. I'm Frances Littman, the founder of the Creatively United for the Planet Nonprofit Society and the coordinator and host of this series to be held each Wednesday from 11 a.m. to noon. I'd like to acknowledge we are hosting this webinar on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people here on beautiful Vancouver Island, for whom we give thanks for this privilege and their stewardship from time eternal. We have much to learn. The Climate and Artists Weekly webinar series is presented by the Creatively United for the Planet Nonprofit Society in partnership with John R. Reardon of the Gail R. Reardon Climate and the Arts Legacy Series and the Ecoforestry Institute Society. Although the video replays are available on Creatively United within a few days of each presentation, one of the benefits of attending live webinars is that you can submit questions anytime during the presentation by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Last week, two of BC's leading ecoforestry experts, Peter Youngford and Eric Pekula, shared the first of this two-part series on ecoforestry. Peter and Eric explained that sustainable forestry management relies on working within nature's limits and that a properly functioning forest is dependent on an equal balance between healthy ecosystems, social values, and economics. They also demonstrated that mature trees left standing can provide a wide array of values such as carbon storage, protection from flooding, fires and pests, and values which will become more valuable as the climate crisis deepens. I'd like to welcome Peter and Eric. Thank you for being here. Welcome everybody and I'll start off uh, first and then uh, Peter will take over after that. Nurturing nature's ecosystems. I'm going to delve into about 60 years of ecosystem forest watershed science that is probably more than um, politicians can handle since they're on a sort of a five year cycle. And 20 years ago, we were doing some ecologically forest based forestry uh, practices under the BC Forest Practices Code. Uh, and even 60 years ago, when this kind of got started, but those are that's way too long ago. But I'd like to sort of go back to the past or back to the future learn from the past to understand our present so we can plan and predict for the future. So there's a nice picture there of, of, uh, of uh, Cathedral Grove, which I took a few years ago, and showing a lot of these structures that I'm gonna talk about, uh, logs in the ground and young trees coming up and big old trees and, and going from there. So what is an old growth forest ecosystem? Is it just trees, rocks, dirt, and fungi, like my wife likes to say? Or is it large old, trees past their prime that are maybe tubes of cellulose rotting away? Or is it just full of conifer trees or does it even contain deciduous trees? And what about those ecological goods and services such as clean and filtered water, stored water, clean air, wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, and soil creation to mention just a few. So there's a nice uh, ridge in the, in the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem which we have less than 1% in old growth condition and there the Douglas fir and the, and the Arbutus there are the two tree key indicators of the coastal Douglas fir zone, which goes from Victoria to Nanaimo. And it has more than just conifers, there's maple trees, there's cedar trees along the edge of the Nanaimo River here, and other couple of pictures that I took as well. So these ecosystems are complex with multiple species that you would expect maybe in a wetter environment on the west coast of the island, but they're also here on the dry east coast as well. And there's, there's, there's some of the, the cathedral grove that we have, and I'll mention later on in my presentation too, that we have six acres of cathedral grove-like forest that we call the Valley of the Giants that we're trying to bring back to wildwood. It used to be part of old wildwood. And there's some of the size of what trees used to be in North Vancouver. There's a big old growth cedar tree that they cut down almost probably a hundred years ago, and that's sort of the size of the forest. And now you have a nice, second growth forest growing up around it too, but it just shows the size of these forests that we used to have and, and still in places in old growth we do have. So 56 years of coastal Douglas fir ecosystem science is based on the International Biological Program, which got started in 1964 in the UK. Uh, and then the US picked it up and got some really neat research done between 1969 and 1979. But of course, you know, 56 years ago is almost too far to anybody to remember. And then we had a neat, the Mount St. Helens blast in 1980 that nobody would have made any connections between a volcano and forest management or forest ecology and a huge 
learning moments in a natural laboratory than about biological legacies and succession. And, what, and then to help them define what were the ecological characteristics of old growth Douglas fir forests and led, led to some really interesting studies and some reporting in the 1980s and 1990s that then came to a head at the Forest Ecosystem Management Assessment Team just before the um, uh, Northwest Forest Planning in, in, in Washington and Oregon got set together. And then some really neat research that started in the, in the early 1980s about people getting actually off the ground and using ropes and literally rappelling through the tops of the trees and find out what was happening in the, in the forest canopies. So there's that one, one of the key papers from 1981 that shows what are the actual ecological characteristics of old growth Douglas fir forest. Until they wrote it down and gone and studied it as a result of the International Biological Program, they didn't really know what made up an old growth forest. And here's another seminal piece as well from 1991, a decade later, but then went through and listed what were the, what were the important parts, the wildlife and the vegetation of unmanaged Douglas fir forest. So building on that knowledge of old growth forest. And coming up with neat diagrams like this, like showing what's the difference when a fire creates a, uh, an ecosystem as a natural disturbance, as a, compared to say on the bottom there, we have partial cutting or clear cutting, what are the results? And, and you can see from the bottom there in C and D that there is no uh, snags, there's no logs in the ground. You can see in the upper two uh, diagrams and that's some of the key biological legacies that we learned from Mount St. Helens and the International Biological Program. And of course, in the, in the United States, it all came to a head because of the listing or the potential listing of the spotted owl by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the 80s and into the 90s that brought all logging to a complete halt. And those studies that I just showed you, and many more, that's just the tip of the iceberg, but then realized that species like the, old, uh, like the spotted owl needed old growth Douglas fir forest. So then they, a judge in 1989 then stopped all logging completely until that forest ecosystem management assessment team in 1993 came up with a master report uh, for President Bill Clinton then to decide what was gonna happen with these old growth forests. And they basically set aside those old growth forests and with a small, small amount, like basically going from six, something like six billion board feet of harvesting down to one billion board feet. So like they dropped, they dropped down to one six of previous harvesting make sure that the old growth forests were there for the spotted owl. And here in BC as well, we got on this, we got this knowledge came to us as well and through our research at the, at the BC Ministry of Forests, which now of course the last 20 years has been put basically onto the back burner, which is one of the, one of my asks I would suggest to people is to get onto the politicians in Victoria and get them to reestablish our research project pro program again, because so much research was done and has been largely forgotten and still kind of creeps along on the edges, but that would be, I think, a big ask we need to do. But here, we, Woody Debris in the Forest of British Columbia and a bunch of other research that helped us get us on the road to that Forest Practices Code in 1994. And as well, here's another one of those other research put out uh, publications in 1993, just before the Forest Ecosystem Management Assessment Team. This is the scientific analysis team. Tons and tons of research that luckily we can draft on as well because it's in, written about the same ecosystem. So we can learn from them. We need to do our own science, but we can build on 50 and 60 years of ecosystem science. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. It's science is coming in every day and these are just the basis of it 25 years ago. And there's the front cover of the Forest Ecosystem Management Assessment Team, which then gave a range of options, but gave ecological, economic, and social options and aspects to the to the to their old growth forests and tried to balance with the with the with the 10 11 options that they had then they were balancing the ecology the social and the economic possibilities from their forests and so a huge learning moment i think for us too that we need to do some kind of analysis like that here in bc so what is then from the all this learning then what was the what did these papers produce and find out about the composition structure and function of old growth forests so they found that there was high biodiversity of plants, of vertebrates, invertebrates, fungi, salamanders, uh, plants and animals, uh, aquatic organisms, and, and huge potential for uh, storing carbon. Uh, they were also, they found that there's old growth dependent species, and we don't have the spotted owl here in, on the island. We have it in, this, in the southern, uh, the lower mainland, up 
from the corridor basically from Chilliwack up to uh, up to um, uh, Whistler, but we have uh, the uh, northern spotted owl, or sorry, the uh, northern goshawk and marbled murrelet, which have important habitat needs here on Vancouver Island as well too. So uh, the U.S. has also done a huge amount of work about the marbled murrelet, basically along the coast from Oregon, Washington, and California. Um, so that's one of the old growth dependent species where these old growth dependent species need cooler, shadier, moister, inside, interior forest habitat conditions uh, that they've been used to for the last uh, 50, uh, you know, less than 10,000 years since the glaciers left. So there's also important structural features that these old growth forests have large live trees, they have large dead trees, snags, and large down logs at the very least that we can actually see uh, on the surface. And there's also a, a multiple of uh, tree sizes, distribution, there's tree ages, tree heights, uh, multiple canopy layers, and we have also in that canopy multiple layers of uh, epiphytes, the plants that grow on other plants, so you have mosses and lichens, and they're all distributed down from the top of the canopy all the way down to the bottom based on levels of light and moisture and heat that, it, that occur in the, in the canopy. And even down on the ground, on the, on, the, on the forest floor too, there's also understory, what we call understory heterogeneity. So there's a wide variety of sherb, shrubs and herbs and, and plants that are growing there too that are uniquely, uh, uniquely uh, situated that they can, depending on the amounts of light and moisture that they're receiving in the types of soil, that there's even um, all kinds of biodiversity on the forest floor as well. Um, an old growth forest are patchier, meaning they're more open, they're not closed canopy. Um, and there's also gaps and patches. There's gaps and patches in these forests that may reach from the forest floor all the way to the top of the canopy, depending on what's, what, how that forest has developed over time. And, and then you've got all these kind of ecological goods and services and processes that it does. It does photosynthesis, it takes in carbon dioxide, produces oxygen, stores carbon, uh, it fixes and processes water. There's night nutrient cycling. It, these old growth forests regulate the hydrological cycle. Yesterday I saw a paper that that um, young forests, even they're growing really fast, are transpiring or giving off moisture three times more than old growth forests are. So their soils have less water going into them, whereas an old growth forest has, doesn't transpire as much, so there's more moisture in the soil, which means then that the moisture can trickle out and move through the system slowly throughout the year. So old growth forests are going to be giving us more water and in the late summer and early fall when we need water to be in the system and into the streams, so when the salmon are returning. Also these forests are putting in large woody debris into streams and moving, uh, uh, moving the water along and also they provide habitat. So there's also natural disturbances that go through these old growth ecosystems, forest fires, windstorms, individual tree falls, and volcanoes. And there's diseases, there's insects and fungi, but at places like Wildwood, we don't fight uh, nature, we let nature happen. So a lot of this research was uh, started uh, and led by Dr. Jerry Franklin, University of Washington, with a whole host of researchers. Uh, some here in BC as well, but in Washington, Oregon, and California, and across the US and Canada, where we, where we learn from Mount St. Helens in particular. And there's, the, there's part of the blast from 1980 that the whole, you know, one third of the mountain blew off. And there's a sort of a, a time lapse of showing it exploding there, but nobody would have made the connection that a volcano had any messages to be telling us about forest management or forest fuel quality or watershed ecology. And there's after the, after the blast and just incredible, the amount of change, the disturbance that occurred there uh, when you had uh, winds coming, blasting off the a blast that came off the mountain that came off at 700 miles an hour and knocked all the trees. And you had uh, ice and snow melting and major, major rivers that were hundreds and hundreds of feet deep as they poured down the mountains and the valleys and changing. And, and taking Spirit Lake and smashing it down and lifting it up into the air and then dropping it back down on the landscape. So it's just incredible, the change. And within days and hours, Jerry and many other scientists were on Mount St. Helens and starting to see what was happening with the ecosystems, the species that were left who had been hiding 
and how was this ecosystem recovery going to occur? And there are some of the the impacts of the of that 700 mile an hour windstorm that came out and blasted trees, snapped them off, blew them over instantly. It was and it was hot gases, so we instantly scorched them standing, and created immense amounts of biological legacies. And there's a, a little bit of a closer up too, and it's quite interesting that in comparison, there's there is a a, a forest fire from southern Wa uh, Oregon, um, Biscuit Fire from 2002, and the two look quite similar. This is volcano, this is a forest fire, but similar kind of effects, natural disturbance, creating huge amounts of biological legacies. So some of the new frontier then, in the early 1980s, people got off the ground and started climbing through the tops of the trees. So this is a, a, a major professor who created a whole new uh, ecological studies called Canopy Ecology. So she climbed up into, the, into the, uh, the maple trees on the Olympic Peninsula and found that in those moss mats that she's sitting on there, that the maple tree was actually putting roots out into those moss mats to collect moisture and nutrients. But up until 1980, nobody knew that. Nobody had been climbing up in the tops of the trees. And they've done a lot of work in, in uh, South America, in the redwoods in California, the giant sequoias in California, and finding out all the different arrangements of species and, and how they're arranged in those canopies. And those canopies are the interface between the forest and the atmosphere and the, and, and the sun. So huge amounts of knowledge have been, and is still coming in every day from this. So we're, we're learning so many things that we, we didn't know existed, and still a lot of this is, is, is lost to people like politicians. So there she is again, too, and you can see the link on there, too. If you can watch 11-minute video there, if you click on that link below on Vimeo, and she talks about her research, and, and she's in, a I think, in a beautiful maple forest there and inside of a Douglas fir forest on the Olympic Peninsula. But those are the kinds of new knowledge. And then that led into the 1990s at a place called Wind River in southern Washington State. And you can see the map there, Seattle and Portland. And you can see where it is on the Columbia Gorge there, Cascade Locks. But nobody thought, well, let's, 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 put an old, let's put a construction crane in the woods and have a look-see and see what we, can, what we can research from that. So leading from Nadlini's research, then Jerry and a bunch of researchers put that in the forest in, in an old growth, five and a half acres of old growth forest in Douglas Fir Forest in Southern Washington State. And as it happens in the 90s, I got to ride on it three times, but there's lots of other people, lots of students, lots of researchers, and there's a little bit of a diagram in the forest around, but showing that you could go up and actually put your monitors into a, a old growth snag that would be standing there and, and measure and count how many lichen and moss were growing on it when you couldn't actually physically climb a snag but you could put your gondola right beside a snag and and do some measurements so tons of new research came from this and this canopy crane was in place until 2011 and now it's a a, a carbon flux station where it's taking meteorological measurements and carbon intake and and ecosystem productivity as part of a big network of of, of plots uh, from the smithsonian institute but there it is, 270 feet tall, and the boom was 270 feet. And, and Jerry at one time said he wanted to sleep way up on top there, on that, on that gantry way up on top there. But it's like, no, I, I don't think I'd be doing that in my nighttime <laughs> in a sleeping bag. But there's all kinds of opportunities in forest to learn and to experience. And this is one of the ways that he wanted to do that. And, and there's another view of the, the camera there. And this is some close-ups of the treetops. And I, we actually had the opportunity once to go touch dwarf mistletoe at the very tip top of 250 foot tall Old Growth Douglas fir. And the guy in this picture, some of you might recognize, Andy McKinnon. So he was down on a field trip with Sarah Gurgle from UBC Landscape Ecology Lab. And looking at the tops of the trees, you can see lichen hanging there. But just some really neat research came out of this well that has kept as part of the 60 years of, of, of ecosystem uh, study and research and new discoveries every day, every week are coming out. And there's a neat book they wrote about it, The Forest in Time. So all of that research led to the Northwest Forest Plan for the Spotted Owl. Our BC Forest Practices Code, the Clackowitz Sound Scientific Panel, who uh, at Wildwood, Nancy Turner, who is on our board and, you know, world-renowned ethnobotanist, she was on that with Jerry. It also led to the uh, Macmillan Bodell project, the Coast Forest Project, where they were going to say they're going to stop ending clear cutting. 
and which then ultimately led to the Coast Forest Conservation Initiative, which then has now led to the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement. So I've got a couple of screen grabs there. And there's the 10-year uh, results of the Northwest Forest Plan. Here is a list that still exists on the internet of all of the forest practices code from the 90s and early 2000s of all of the books that we have out there that still exist that we could be using. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We could take these and start running with these right away in our forest management. And there's the screenshot of the Clackamas Sound Scientific Panel. And here's the front page of a almost 400 page report that was written by Fred Benell and Laurie Kremsader there and Mark Boyland about what's the ecological rationale for changing forest management in Mac and Bo's tenures. And there's the cons Coast Conservation, sorry, Coast Forest Conservation Initiative, which this website was down, but is returned. So if you click there in, in the EBM sections, it gives tons of detail, which references a lot of our research from BC and then from, from the US Pacific Northwest. And there's the splash screen for the Great Bear Rainforest Agreement. And I've included the link there in the upper left corner there. But so what types of management are there? Forest management, so you've got clear cutting, clear cut reserves, there's patch cutting, there's shelter wood, there's commercial thinning, like places like, uh, well, the east side of the Vancouver Island here used to be a major hub for commercial thinning, which we don't do of any of anymore. In the 70s, 80s, 90s, we used to do tons of commercial thinning. And then of course you have ecosystem-based management. So this is a really good diagram about what is, how an ecosystem-based management approach could have worked and there's so many, so many details to be drilled down in here, but just gives you a flow of how it could actually work. And we could be applying this across the forests of BC and we don't do any of it. Like we, 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 we focus on timber production and we don't see what's happening to these ecosystems. We don't bring in new science, new knowledge, and then revise our policies. I mean, it's a huge opportunity. And I think in the face of climate change and, um, and now in learning today from the COVID-19 thing that we have to be doing, we have to be treating our ecosystems differently. And ecosystem-based management is the way to do that. So also here's a list of under the banner of ecosystem-based management, ecological forest management. If you're doing restoration thinning, you could also do that for fire smarting in area, variable retention harvesting, aggregate or dispersed retention. But I would suggest that all of those, those sort of first four are AAC based, annual allowable cut based. So they're always looking after a set amount of timber. Us at Wildwood, we're doing ecoforestry, so we're not AAC based. We start with the ecosystem or this stand and we go in and Peter and I and Barry have stood and talked for half an hour or an hour about just a small patch of trees and try to decide and touch and look and look up, look down, look at the ground to see what is this patch of forest need as opposed to well how much how many AAC can we get out of it is our starting point that's uh, that's an end point and a later point it's not the starting point so ecological based management too is focused on retaining recruiting creating biological legacies such as dead trees down logs patches of habitat and ecological processes and species so you're trying to lifeboat these bits and pieces and send them into the next year for you're paying them forward into the next ecosystem and you want to make sure that there's a good age class distribution so we have young forests because uh, jerry and a bunch of people are saying that we need to make sure that there's young habitat young forest habitat out there too because there's species that depending on the age of the forest there there's different species that are used to those conditions as these forests move through time so you want to have young forests you want to have middle-aged forests and you want to have old forests and you also want to make sure that you're retaining enough interior habitat to make sure that there's cool, shady and moist conditions and that it's a large enough patch to make sure that it's not going to get impacted by edge effects. And you want to make sure the landscape elements are connected. And, and if, you, if they aren't connected, you might want to do some restoration to make sure there is that landscape level con connectivity too. It's not just individual stands. You want to make sure that the landscape is connected in particular for watershed connectivity. So there's some video and reading links on the screen so you can freeze these. We got our wildwood uh, ecoforestry.ca page there that about resources. There's reading there and some videos. The top one, the YouTube is my YouTube channel where I've collected a bunch of videos together and I'll bring the Creative United there too will be in their, in their own playlist. And I've also included a link on the bottom here for silviculture harvesting systems. So that's a Google search and they'll 
give you all kinds of information about what are the different types of harvesting systems, and I and I mentioned a few of them a couple of screens back. So as well, we're also in in the process of trying to buy back six acres from Wildwood uh, that used to be part of Old Wildwood and bring it back. I call it the Valley of the Giants. We call it the Valley of the Giants, and literally, it's like a Cathedral Grove, but in Yellow Point, just near the Nanaimo Airport. So. Here's the web page there. I got the link there. Here's a screen capture from that page. And we are trying to repatriate those six acres and bring them back to Wildwood. Um, it's also is the uh, area that is a, is the headwaters for the, uh, the watershed that leads down to the two wetlands near the homestead. So it would be really nice to bring that back. So we are uh, in a funding drive to, to bring money to uh, to um, the to the wildwood to buy back the six acres and make it part of wildwood again, so that's kind of my my ask and my shout out, um, and it would be really we could really use some help uh, in the community to uh, uh, to bring the six acres back to wildwood, and I think that is it. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and there's the cathedral grove again. And I'll pass you along to Peter. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric. I will be continuing with um, ecoforestry solutions with a special focus on landscape level uh, solutions, ecoforestry solutions. And uh, I talked quite a bit about wildwood last time. Wildwood is small, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, this model with continuous cover ecoforestry is um, certainly a model that could be uh, expanded a lot across the landscape. It is more challenging to manage, as Eric already mentioned. It um, is probably also um, comes with some higher harvesting costs but there are also many benefits to it. I think intuitively it will probably be a very good fit for uh, close to populated areas, close to communities, and um, it uh, certainly um, can go into uh, places more remote, into forested areas more remote, but my gut feeling is that just the complexity of uh, single tree selection um, is not going to um, uh, result in that being applied a lot in remote areas. Um, also, as Eric already said, uh, there is a need in most forested landscapes for openings. And I'm not here to advocate clear cuts, um, but openings, and I'm more thinking of generous variable retention systems. Uh, openings are needed in most forested landscapes, uh, bigger openings. And um, so the continuous cover ecoforestry model of wildwood is not the right one for everywhere in BC. Also, you want to have um, stand initiating disturbance intervals that are longer than single tree selection, group tree selection is a better fit. So if we are thinking about, okay, what can we do? What, what are uh, good solutions on the landscape? I want to get back again to the slide I already showed you last time. Uh, thanks to Silver Ecoforestry Consultants and Herb Hammond, this um, part on the left there uh, very, makes very obvious that we are really dependent, completely dependent on a uh, functioning healthy ecosystem. Everything we do, our existence, including uh, our eco economic activity, it's all dependent on this, on this uh, ecosystem, uh, on the ecosystem functioning well on a landscape level too. 
So this is really the necessary starting point again for any um, considerations and explorations of what best to do on the landscape. And I, this uh, you might remember too from last week's presentation. It's uh, the natural disturbance types uh, that you can find in the in the biodiversity guidebook uh, for BC from 1995 and it certainly is a good starting point to um, learn about what historically happened naturally on the landscape. Here is a, a very good uh, sample of mapping that the Sierra Club of BC does. You see on the left the uh, Vancouver Island and and the red and orange colors on the east coast. I don't know if you can know. Well, maybe you can see my mouse here on the east coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, they show that there is um, a lot of zero to 10% uh, of old growth left and some 10 to 30%. Uh, according to the natural disturbance type two, where we are here on the East Coast and where Wildwood is, we should be having about 30%, almost 30% old growth. So there's definitely a deficit. In my ideal world, uh, after looking at those two scenarios, the, the historic natural past and what we are facing now, I would say it's time to hand it over to the ecologists and scientists, independent ecologists and scientists, to tell us what um, is needed, what kind of action, what kind of planning is needed. And I would let them do the, uh, put the framework in place and, and uh, any kind of stakeholder consultation can and should then take place after that. So um, here we go with some proposed, uh, more proposed ecoforestry solutions. Um, what we are really suggesting um, as the one big um, measure that would uh, give the, the biggest benefit to uh, the forests of BC, the people of BC and the, all the forest dwellers is to grow more old growth forests and mature forests again. So to increase the portion of old growth and mature forests to reestablish near natural historic levels that you could achieve so much with this one goal achieved. It, um, really makes the debate of clear cut versus retention a minor issue. I'm not advocating clear cuts again. I'm all for variable retention, but uh, we need to establish on the landscape, again, a more natural age class distribution in the forest. So how would we go about it? I suggest that we immediately set aside at least 30%. And that's just a number that really the ecologists uh, need to give us, but I think 30% is uh, a fairly reasonable number. So to immediately set aside 30% of the old growth area, which would naturally exist per um, ecological unit and to set it aside as old growth ecological reserves to never be logged. Um, you can call it lifeboats, biological lifeboats. That's what they definitely are. So um, that would be the first step. So we do not lose more old growth um, because right now it's different in different, um, in different uh, ecological units. We are losing different percentages and at least to have 30% set aside immediately 
as ecological li lifeboats. Further, uh, and that will likely be the case in many ecological units, uh, if there's not enough old growth left, uh, next we are going to look at mature forests in these units to get us up to the 30% then as old growth recruitment areas. If not enough old growth, growth is available on public land, it will be necessary to also look uh, at private land and what um, portions of old growth and mature forest are still available to contribute to that ecological lifeboat. Uh, it is of course a contentious issue, but uh, we should not uh, exclude it. And in some areas of the province or in the world, private land is a big portion. And so you cannot just overlook that. On Vancouver Island, there's a big portion of private land. And yes, we'll probably have to look at financial incentives to, um, or even repurchasing to get it back into public ownership. When we establish old growth reserves, we gotta think about connectivity uh, between it. So that needs to happen at the same time. This consideration needs to go into it. Now, more on the topic of, um, of growing more old growth and mature forests again. It will be needed to lower the AAC, the annual allowable cut or cut rate. And I suggest to do it in two phases. Phase one, get it quickly to a level where we can achieve forest carbon neutrality, meaning that our forest management does not contribute to more carbon in the atmosphere. The forest absorbs about as much as uh, forest management leads to uh, forest, uh, sorry, carbon getting into the atmosphere. So that's the minimum. We need to be at least carbon neutral with our forest management. Everything else is really actually embarrassing. Um, so we got to get there quickly. And then we can more gradually move the forest closer to its natural age and thereby, sorry, natural age class distribution and thereby give industry uh, a better chance to adapt to the new reality. Logging will, as a consequence, uh, eventually become sustainable again. And if logging becomes sustainable, then the communities that depend on it will also become sustainable. And before logging becomes sustainable, if we do more with the wood that we harvest, so if we invest into, into a value added industry, uh, we will get sooner to, um, sustainable communities before logging, the rate of logging is even sustainable. The uh, percentage of valuable logs will definitely go up over time again. That is the advantage of getting closer to a natural age class distribution. And uh, it will also, will probably also be the case that any kind of logs will gain value if the supply is being curta curtailed, diminished. So what other uh, ecoforestry solutions do we propose? I already talked about uh, value added industries. We gotta, gotta uh, make them uh, more of a reality again in BC. We lost a lot of that uh, over the last decade, especially. And um, it is a shame because there are way more jobs in value added industries than there are in logging. So we can easily compensate for the loss in logging jobs with the lower AAC. We can easily compensate with uh, value added industries. Uh, 
Further, again, back to private managed forest land, the standards as they are currently in BC will need to be raised. Uh, if you, and they have their own uh, legislation for how to manage uh, private, private managed forest land. And if you have ever seen uh, this legislation in action and uh, looked at how much, how many or how few trees are usually left next to streams or rivers, then you know what I'm talking about. That's what, just one aspect of the, of the uh, too low standards of forest management on private land. Next, uh, another suggestion, increase the number of community forests because community forests have a tendency to, uh, to let the forest management be improved over time through the participation of the community members who have a connection to the place. A very important part about good forest management and stewardship is the connection that people have to the place. And so I'm really hopeful that, that there will be many more community forests, um, of course, including uh, First Nations, very, very important. And it will, over time, lead to forest, good forest stewardship, if not from the very beginning. Um, further, here's an, another idea to establish an industry independent advisory board for forest policy development, comprised of scientists, First Nations representatives, resource professionals, members of the public, all of them at arm's length from, uh, from industry, from a uh, big forest industry. Uh, yes, you're right, if uh, you suspect I am, we are not happy with the uh, relationship uh, between the government and uh, forest industry. So I think it is important to have an independent advisory board. Further, um, I suggest to outlaw the exercising of management prerogative against forest stewardship advice by natural resource professionals. If you're not familiar with the term management prerogative, it basically means that license holders have the last word how the forest is being uh, managed on, on the licensed land. And unfortunately, if a, say, a forest or a biologist suggests that, say, a portion of old growth, growth should be uh, should be kept uh, for biodiversity reasons. They don't have the last word on that. It is the licensee who can say, uh, thank you very much for the suggestion, but um, I will be exercising my management prerogative. I think this is just not uh, something we can keep. And in a way makes really uh, almost useless uh, all the good knowledge that uh, natural resource professionals do have and can offer. Stop the application of synthetic chemicals in the forest on plantations. We don't need herbicides. We don't need fertilization. We don't know, for example, what fertilization actually means for the relationship between tree roots and and mycorrhizal fungi for the soil, for the very complex soil ecosystem. We don't really know what it does and a healthy forest does not need the input of synthetic chemicals. Now, uh, as the last point here, before I wrap it up, uh, I also think that stocking and free growing standards need to uh, change so that all ecologically suited tree species are treated more equally. 
right now the the preferred and acceptable species that distinguish is being uh, distinction is being made for uh, in the stalking standards and that means that the preferred species those are usually species that are currently uh, that are currently having a high economic value they are being preferred and um, that kind of uh, preferential choice I think strongly we need to do away with uh, the the most important focus should be on which species are most ecologically suited and um, and choose from them freely without uh, preference so I'm wrap, wrapping it up here with uh, with this slide and I we think as the ecoforestry Institute that these proposed ecoforestry solutions would strongly deliver uh, towards very important goals shared by most of society biodiversity protection and restoration climate change mitigation fire resistance just think of old growth forests and deciduous species being um, good fire breaks it would help uh, with the reconciliation effort with uh, first nations with uh, human health and uh, with diversific with the diversification of the economy and with economic sustainability so i just want to conclude with saying who wouldn't agree that it would be very worthwhile to uh, make big progress towards these um, these very uh, worthwhile goals and i'll hand it over to francis and i thank for your interest and patience oh that was remarkable thank you so much peter and thank you eric what a wealth of knowledge we'll be posting your questions from last week and the answers because there were some really great questions and answers and the ones from this week and i'm also going to suggest that what we could do perhaps is include some links or even we could compose a letter together that people could use and send to their government officials i'd like to note that we have ray travers uh, on this program today and ray is a celebrated uh, master forester and we're, we really value what ray has done but ray asks um it it it's the response or says it's the responsibility of a leader to stop doing what is not working and continuously improve what is um, so his question is what messages should citizens direct to the BC forest minister and that's maybe something like we could put into a letter to perhaps draft together and then he carries on to say BC politicians will likely say that lots of old trees exist outside the land planned for logging timber harvesting land base bark you know base parks etc to help citizens respond what is the difference between old trees and old growth only six percent of the original old growth forest on the bc coast remains at low elevations and is being rapidly logged you know trees don't make a forest it's having uh, trees don't just make a forest it's everything else that's in a forest as well too so that yeah there may be odd trees across the landscape that are old but in order to have really old growth you need to have everything that's in that forest and it's not just trees it's everything that's why they say like planting trees is is the ultimate solution to climate change well planting maybe is a help but you got to let them get old and let all these processes under the ground and above ground do their magic and old trees are the mother trees that do photosynthesis so Bruce asks, what about burn piles? I, I'm not sure if that's something you want to get into, but just quickly, what, what are they? <laughs> I mean, I'm asking what are they, and he, he's asking what about burn piles? Well, it is a practice that goes with clear-cut logging. And uh, so in order to be able to plant more easily afterwards, all the rests of um, the, the wood on the ground are being piled up and then burned. There is a shift now happening where uh, this is actually being utilized instead of being burned um, for for uh, pallets for example or pulp mills to use that there's definitely a push in that direction with that comes the danger of taking even more biomass out of the forest so the best thing would really be if anything that is not being utilized uh, stays in the forest the tops 
uh, any rotten parts, uh, branches and so on stay in the forest. That would be the best practice. Okay, thank you. And as far as jumping ahead to like what we can say, because uh, there's quite a few people concerned about, you know, how do we deal with forest lobbies and the, and the corporate power? We'll cover all that in, in this letter I think, that we're going to put together. So I just want to put everybody's mind at rest. And thank you. Um, our Climate and Art Series partner, John O'Reardon, uh, is, is on this uh, program today to summarize some of the creative solutions we've heard here today and the lessons learned that can inform policies for forest management. John, I'd love for you to, to jump into that. Thank you, Francis. Uh, very impressed by your uh, comments and recommendations, Peter and Eric, I thought you did a brilliant uh, summary of how we can make our forests more sustainable. I'd like to put uh, some comments together to help you with this letter that you're putting together. So let me start with some perspective. Over the last uh, 10,000 years, the natural carbon cycle for the earth has been in what's called dynamic equilibrium. That basically means that any creation of, of carbon has been offset by uh, carbon sequestration and storage. Um, uh, but that uh, balance has actually changed somewhat because over time, some of the carbon has been stored in the biota and it degrades and composts into sedimentation. And that sedimentation, of course, is our fossil fuel beds. So we're now breaking the natural carbon cycle by accessing these carbon storage beds, increasing the amount of carbon that's being used, and that's changing the atmospheric carbon and the carbon in the water causing problems with climate change and, acid, and ocean acidification. So we have to start to move back to a more neutral carbon state, uh, cycle in the next 30 years as part of our global commitment. So I think there are four components of policy that have been touched on by Peter and Eric, and I think would be a cornerstone of the letter that we might send to the uh, policymakers. The first is that trees are a wonderful st storage of carbon. And Peter has talked about the need as a minimum to have our current forests be carbon neutral. In other words, they're not generators of carbon, but at least they absorb all the carbon that's being created. But I think we have to go for further. I think we have to look at uh, reforestation in large scale. We have to bring more trees into our ecosystem and more trees will allow us to start to create more storage in, that, in the global system and start to uh, offset the increase of carbon in the atmosphere. So I would encourage people to plant their own trees in their backyards and, uh, and encourage them to be involved in the communities that have goals to create urban forests. And I think we need our new forest policy to look um, aggressively at opening up new areas for new forests to increase carbon storage through our forest system. The second policy area is economics. And uh, Peter talked about the need to get more value added from our trees so that those trees that stay and can be used for commercial operations can get the maximum value of that to support our communities. I don't think we're nearly far enough down the value added chain right now to create the additional economic growth that's required to have a sustainable forest. The third area is uh, nature's bounty. Forests are natural components of nature systems and in two weeks time, we'll be having a presentation by John Pomeroy about Canada's water futures and the need to have a new look at the way we manage water as the climate and hydrological cycle change over the next 50 years. And he's gonna be talking about the important role that trees make in, in controlling floods, in offsetting droughts, in controlling pests and managing fires. So the kind of work that um, our recommendation that Peter said about needing at least 30% of our forests to be resilient to climate change and build the kind of base that we need for a stable forest is critical. But finally, uh, forests provide a fourth area, spiritual and ascetic value, critical to our First Nations, but also critical to ourselves for our spiritual well-being and our ability to be in touch with uh, nature and the, uh, the continue to be full souls in the sense of the term. So I'd like to think that we can have these four areas of carbon storage, economic value, nature's bounty, and spirituality as a cornerstone of our letter going forward to the policymakers. 
I will be talking a little bit more about the spiritual nature of forests in the two poems I'd like to read at the end of this series. That's a perfect segue, John. I, <laughs> I would love for you to just uh, lead us into that and I'll illustrate those with some of my photography. Thank you. So I have two poems. One is called Trees by Joyce Keimer. I think that I shall never see a poem lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. A tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. Upon whose bosom snow has lain, who intimately lives with rain. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And the second poem is called The Enchanted Forest by Joseph Rinaldi. I enjoy strolling along the narrow path as it meanders through the forest. It generates a feeling of relaxation and puts my troubled mind to rest. The forest is peaceful and quiet. I appreciate its immense cover of shade and I am focused and comfortable in this sanctuary nature has made. I feel a sense of enchantment in the cool, refreshing air as I seek the hidden secrets that the forest has to bear. I hear the strange sounds of the forest as I quietly make my way and stop to observe the wonders nature unfolds for me this day. I enjoy strolling along the narrow path. It brings a welcome peace to mind to me. I thank the forces of nature for this moment of soothing serenity. Thank you. Beautiful, John. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for everybody for attending. I'm really excited about what's going to come out of this. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Take Bye. care. Bye for now. Bye. -bye.